in Moscow again tonight. Thanks so much, James. And let's bring in ABC News Chief White House Correspondent Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, the White House today issued some limited sanctions in response to Russia's decision to recognize those separatist regions. But what if Russian troops actually enter and invade the country? What are your sources telling you about how the U.S. would respond to that? Yeah, Lindsay, uh, good evening. That, that really is the million dollar question right now. I'm hearing that we could be looking potentially at another round of sanctions tomorrow, uh, and those would likely target Russia specifically. Look, administration officials say it's really too early to tell exactly what the cause and effect is because they say they are still actively observing and assessing what Russia is doing at this hour. This is a very fluid situation. The White House is very much of the mind that Russia is still planning to invade. They say that invasion could happen in a a matter of days as early as potentially a matter of hours. Now, whether this triggers these severe sanctions that uh, President Biden has been threatening for weeks now, that remains to be seen. What also remains to be seen, Lindsay, is whether these sanctions, severe or not, even matter. Today, Vladimir Putin, in that hour-long speech, brushed off the prospect of increased sanctions from the West, saying that the, rest, oh, the West always finds a way to, to threaten more sanctions to Russia. But the point right now, Lindsay, at this hour, officials here at the White House, administration officials, say this window for diplomacy seems to be diminishing. It's still out there, but they're losing hope. And those sanctions really potentially a, a moot point uh, either way. Cecilia Vega reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much as always, Cecilia. There are, of course, a lot of questions about what President Putin's latest move means in these rising tensions. For more perspective, we bring in former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant General Douglas Lute. Uh, General Lute, we thank you so much for joining us to help try to break all this down. Let's start with President Putin's decision today to recognize the independence of separatist regions in eastern Ukraine. How does this announcement escalate the situation that's happening right now in the east? Well, first of all, it's very familiar. This is exactly the play he made in 2008 in Georgia, uh, and then again in 2014, first with Crimea, and then in the same area, the Donbass. So this is uh, straight out of President Putin's playbook. And we've seen celebrations like fireworks coming from those regions. That area has unverified claims of military aggression by the Ukrainian government. How could this change what's happening right now at the border? Well, I think, uh, first of all, he will uh, masquerade. He will he will engineer activities in Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, celebrations, flying of the Russian flag, and so forth. But this is for a very narrow audience. This is for the few Ukrainians who are still in that region, have been evacuated, and also for his own audience at home. Uh, we should not in any way believe uh, this charade or, or take stock in it. And, and as you say, that this is right out of the Putin playbook. His remarks today really focused on the building, the, the greatness of Russia. Historically, how does this move uh, mirror the simple, similar tactics that he's used before to gain new territory, as you said, uh, with his attempt in Georgia in the past? Well, to this day. Uh, as a result of the conflict with Georgia in 2008, Russia occupies two of uh, Georgia's provinces. Russian troops are stationed on Georgian territory. He violated Georgian territorial integrity in 2008. He did it again here in Ukraine by seizing the Crimea in 2014 and then by supporting these same separatists in the Donbas. And if he crosses the border again with Russian troops, this is, we should be very clear. We should be crystal clear. This is an invasion. And the United States is imposing sanctions on Russia. Is this just a slap on the wrist, essentially, for Putin? Well, look, I think there are more sanctions to come. Uh, so when tomorrow dawns and the administration has a chance to take advantage of the diplomatic surge of the last several weeks and bring together our European allies and partners alongside American, American sanctions, I think we'll see a much bigger announcement tomorrow in terms, of, uh, in terms of the repercussions, in terms of the consequences of President Putin's move. Hey, kind of a two-part question for you here. I'm curious, what does victory look like for, for Putin and Russia, and is this what Russians really want? Well, it's very difficult to say. I mean, obviously, in the near step, he wants to solidify his control over these two breakaway provinces. Uh, but, you know, the speech today and his this, this uh, charade that we saw as part of a national security, a so-called National Security Council meeting, uh, really portends that he has bigger aims. Uh, and certainly those aims probably lead to the capital city in Kyiv. Um, you can imagine some sort of decapitation strike uh, in Kyiv uh, itself. But candidly, we shouldn't get 
fixated only on Ukraine. Ukraine is the problem today, and it will be for weeks to come. But President Putin made clear in his speech today that he's got ambitions beyond that. His ambitions beyond that are to essentially to rewind the clock 30 years uh, and, and reverse the progress made in Western Europe, uh, se uh, certainly Central and Eastern European, uh, Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and if possible, break the ties between the United States and its European allies. Yeah, I mean, he really made it clear today that what happens in Ukraine doesn't necessarily stay uh, limited to Ukraine. And as of now, President Biden has accepted a meeting in principle with President Putin if an invasion does not happen. What's the likelihood, do you think, of a diplomatic resolution at this point? Well, it certainly seems to be dwindling in terms of prospects for a diplomatic solution. Again, I think the critical measure here, the critical signal, which will not be missed, uh, is if Russian troops cross the border and violate territorial integrity of Ukraine. And the UN Security Council is meeting tonight. What role does the UN play at this point? Look, the UN is important because it is one of the one of the posts that uh, Russia still holds as one of the five permanent permanent members of the Security Council, which is a prestigious post. So when the UN Security Council meets, uh, it'll be quite an interesting conversation because Russia will be uh, there and in, in a public stage uh, have to have to defend itself to the world. Uh, very interesting. Also seated in that same Security Council meeting will be China's China. Uh, Russia's so-called uh, partner. Uh, and I think there's an interesting angle here that China may not be um, fully on board with Russia's move. In fact, the Chinese foreign minister at a security conference in Munich this week said that China respects territorial integrity, national sovereignty, and Ukraine is no exception. Oh, very interesting. Okay, Lieutenant General Lute, we thank you so much for your insight. Appreciate it. Back home now to the progress against our nation's battle against COVID. The FDA chief out with new information on the possibility of a fourth shot. But with so many Americans still holding off on getting a booster shot, is it realistically possible? ABC's Trevor Old brings us this report. Tonight, growing signs another COVID booster shot may be on the horizon later this year. One, two, three. The FDA's vaccine chief, Dr. Peter Marks, telling the New York Times the best strategy may be to pair the next booster with the influenza vaccine next fall and get as many people as possible boosted then. But he and other health officials stress there's still not enough data to recommend a fourth dose. And a recent CDC study found the first Pfizer and Moderna boosters are highly effective offering 91% protection from hospitalizations, though it falls to 78% after four to five months. 78% is pretty good. It likely will go down sometime. We don't know for sure. We're hoping it'll hold tight up there. But if it does go down, I think you can expect some modification of the recommendation. A fourth shot is already recommended for the immunocompromised, but the pace of booster shots has slowed dramatically overall. 50% of eligible Americans still haven't received one, more than 85 million people. Trevor, thank you. Now to the back-to-back -back winter storm sweeping across the country tonight. Weather alerts in effect for more than two dozen states. Let's bring our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, from North Carolina tonight. She has the track. How's it going, Ginger? And, you know, here mild, and today we do not have the weather here. It's well west of us, but boy, do we see a lot going on. There are blizzard warnings that include Lisbon, North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota. They've been in it for hours. Remember, that's not just how much snow falls, but the wind associated with it. And then you look at Riverside County or San Diego County, California. You've got a winter storm warning there all the way up to Rice Lake, Wisconsin. But it's the front end where we see those flood watches pop in that I really want you to pay attention to because tonight we could still see some damaging winds with an embedded thunderstorm that could have a tornado, some wind shear in the very lowest levels. As this moves east, though, it's all about that heavy rain moving with that line, the flash flood threat that includes Paducah or Memphis back to even Little Rock. Then as that moves east, it will lose a little bit of steam. But look at Nashville tomorrow night at 7 p.m., still in the severe threat. Now that mild air is all part of this storm. It will not be so mild. When the next storm comes at us, we're gonna get very close to some winter precipitation on the I-94 at five north of New York, certainly looking like some heavy snow in New England by the end of the week. Those advisories, alerts, and watches just lighting up all over the map. And Ginger, millions may also experience some wild temperature swings this week. Spring one day, winter the next. The, the winter whiplash just continues. 
That's when you know you're getting to late February, early March, when you start questioning what season it is. So this is what it looks like now. We just put a couple of cities on the map here from Washington, D.C. That'll be 70, then start falling to 42. Look at New York in the 60s and then shave off 30 degrees. So all within a day. And this one really gets you that deep Arctic air. Oklahoma City, 70 down to tomorrow, feeling like 26. Roy, New Mexico in the 20s. Lindsay. Er, all right, Ginger, thanks so much. And when we come back, the terrifying head-on collision all captured on police dash cam. The new potential challenge looming for home buyers, rising interest rates. We'll take a closer look. But up next, the controversy in competitive swimming and the question, do trans women have an unfair biological advantage? Stay with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now, with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, Shaw amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Take a look at this terrifying dash cam video of a head-on collision involving a police cruiser in Middleton, Wisconsin. The dash cam shows the driver of another car veering into oncoming traffic and then slamming into the police car. The driver who was injured was arrested and charged with driving while intoxicated. An officer and dispatcher were treated for minor injuries. Now to the controversy that's roiling the waters of a collegiate swimming as the University of Pennsylvania's Leah Thomas, a transgender athlete assigned male at birth, dominated this weekend's women's swimming Ivy League championships, winning three individual events and smashing records. But does she have an unfair advantage in the pool? after transitioning from male to female while in college. It's a debate that's dividing the swimming community and even her own teammates. Here's ABC's Juju Chang. Leah Thomas will capture the win in the 200-yard freestyle. Controversy along with victory as transgender athlete Leah Thomas took home wins in the 100, 200, and 500-yard freestyle at the Ivy League Women's Championship over the weekend, shattering records along the way. A new pool record, a new meet record. 
Thomas, who was assigned male at birth, competed on UPenn's men's team for three seasons before undergoing two years of hormone therapy. Schuler Baylor, the first openly transgender athlete on an NCAA Division I men's team, calls Thomas's success a step forward for trans representation. Watching a trans person thrive in sport is amazing because we are so discriminated against. And so for her to be able to get up there and win and break some records, awesome, right? Um, but it's also just awesome that she's able to be herself and compete. Swimmer Isaac Hainick, a trans man who has delayed hormone treatment, competes on the Yale women's team. He's defending Thomas, who he'd beaten in the water back in January. I think that a lot of the very strong takes come from people, you know, misunderstanding what it means for Leah to be complying with the rules, to, you know, have undertaken all of these steps to ensure that things are fair. Isaac began socially transitioning last year, undergoing top surgery but he decided to continue to compete for the women's team. The big thing that I chose not to do was, was start hormones. I felt really attached to the women's team here at Yale, and I wanted to, you know, complete what I signed up for. But for other athletes, especially trans women, the choice between self and sport is tricky, often requiring hormones to qualify to compete on women's teams. All this fueling a national debate on how to be inclusive to trans athletes. Critics argue athletes like Thomas have an unfair advantage. From the beginning, I've said that biological boys should not play in women's sports. Thomas declined to speak with ABC News, but recently shared her experience on the Swim Swam podcast. I've experienced a lot of muscle loss and strength loss. I have to, like, readjust my goals and what I think of as a good time or a good pace to hold in practice. Leah Thomas has been through puberty. So that's 10 years of having testosterone making broader shoulders and bigger lungs and strength. Nancy Hogshead Maycar is a women's rights attorney and former three-time Olympic gold medal swimmer. She coordinated a petition among Thomas's UPenn teammates, speaking out against her participation in the league championship. Men and women are built very differently. so. We created women's sports specifically so that biological women could have a place to win, to get accolades, to make a living. All of the things that come with elite sports. They want her to lead a happy, productive life, but they don't think it's fair that she's competing in the women's category. That's not trans hate. After the NCAA recently said each sport could set its own rules, USA Swimming announced new guidelines for trans female athletes, requiring a lower level of testosterone and adding an independent three-person medical panel to determine whether the athlete has an unfair competitive advantage. But the NCAA announced this month that the new USA Swimming guidelines would not be enforced this year, clearing the way for Leah to compete in her final year. Unfortunately, it has become about Leah Thomas, and that is a tragedy because it never should have. We have so many sport leaders that are paid exceptionally well to be able to come up with sports policy, but they weren't going to do that until we had somebody like Leah Thomas coming forward. Our thanks to Juju for that. And we are now joined by famed swimmer Diana Naya, the first and only person to swim unaided from Cuba all the way to Florida. Her memoir, Find a Way, is out now. Thank you so much for joining us. Lindsay, it's my pleasure. How are you? I am well. I cannot complain. Glad to be able to talk with you tonight. Now, you, of course, recently wrote an op-ed about the case of Leah Thomas in the Washington Post, headlined, Celebrate Trans Athletes, But Give Cisgender Women a Fair Shot at Victory. And you made the case that athletes born as male who transition after puberty may have an unfair physical advantage. Just explain your stance for us. Well, and you know, let me be clear that my my story and my opinion isn't certainly about Leah Thomas. It's about sure. it's about the you know the issue you know at, at large. And you know the point is that sports are not just about inclusion and participation. Um, if they were, then we would just say, well, we don't even need men's and women's divisions. Let's just have a big everybody play football and everybody run track all together and we'll just be a big happy family competing as you do with five-year-olds. But once a male 
as a, a born biological male has gone through puberty, has had 10 to 20 times the testosterone exposure um, than any cisgender woman, meaning a, a, a woman born biologically female. Let's say that male who went through puberty, as Leah Thomas has, as a male, then does years Leah Thomas, in case, was two years, but does years of estrogen therapy to bring the testosterone down to a level that would match what cisgender women have. So you bring the testosterone down, but there are still a whole host of what we call legacy traits. They're called basically retained traits you know, that, that come from that exposure to testosterone from, you know, in utero all the way through puberty. And now you've got larger bones, longer bones, you've got bigger lungs. We could go over 20, 25 different legacy traits that make it unfair to compete against a biological woman. And, um, I'm just, I'm torn because I want inclusion. I love the binary that's disappearing from our society in general. And we're opening our arms to transgender, inter, intersex individuals, all kinds of more than just the boy and the girl. You know, we're open now, but not in the world of women's sports. It's just, it's not fair. Um, and I'll tell you something, this sounds radical, but if we continue like this and open up women's sports to all trans athletes, one day we will never know the next Serena Williams, the next Katie Ledecky, the, the next great women athletes, because trans athletes will be superior to all those wonderful superior women athletes. Well, I want you to take a listen to something that Yale swimmer Isaac Hennig, who has competed against Thomas, told Arjun Jutang. I think one of okay. the things that I always come back to is an athlete like Michael Phelps, who we can all point to and say, yeah, he has twice the lung capacity of, of any one of his competitors, but no one was upset or, you know, calling it unfair. If you're going to point to those things, then your conclusion has to be, well, yeah, they were built to do sport, you know, or they were built to swim. It, it's not about puberty because anyone can can go through any sort of hormonal change and still not be a great athlete because there is just so much more to great athletes than hormones. What do you say no, that, of that, that, that argument, that, Diana, that regardless I, I, of gender I, I, or hormones, different athletes may have different physical advantages? Yeah, within within their gender. And uh, so it's a full Faulty argument, and um, there's there's no scientist who could uh, who could sit and listen to that and and say, oh yeah. And so Michael Phelps, it's not fair. He was born with you know longer arms, and you know he's got a bigger lung capacity within the male environment of sports. There are all kinds of talents and abilities, a big, big range, and Michael Phelps is at the top of it. The same with women's sports. But in this case, for the trans athlete, you're bringing male characteristics that aren't just an individual's talent, they have to do with being born and going through puberty male. That, that, that you know, the female athlete doesn't want to step up to the blocks and compete against someone who is inherently ha has, has characteristics that do not make that individual fair to compete against. So who should a transgender woman compete against? Yeah, that's, that's the problem of where we are right now. You know, I said in my article that in 1967, women, 67, I was graduating high school already, women were not allowed to compete in the marathon, the Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon. You know, they just, oh, there was a group, you know, of people who thought, oh, they're too frail. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm like hold the world record for the longest swim in history, more than any man's ever done. So we're not too frail to do anything. But that was the thinking, well, now, we springboard forward to where we are today and 50% of the Boston Marathon runners are women, 50%. So there was no place for us at a certain time until there was Title IX, you know, until we proved ourselves, we had nowhere to compete except against men. Don't think it's fair for the trans athlete who has gone from male to female and had puberty as a male to compete against cisgender women. Um, but I wish there were a place they, that that trans athlete deserves to have a place to compete and fulfill their potential and feel their joy. And right now, we don't have a solution. We, we don't.
Diana Nyad, we thank you so much for this conversation. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you, Lizzie. Take care. Still ahead here on Prime, Britain's queen in isolation after testing positive for COVID, the latest on her condition. The investigation into the murder of a college student shot and killed while walking home from class. The Derby winner stripped from the record books. We take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day, a classroom watching Arthur as the show says goodbye after 25 years. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen. She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, a record-breaking win in the Kentucky Derby is no more. Today, racing officials moved to strip last year's winner, Medina Spirit, of the victory after a failed drug test. We take a look by the numbers. Medina Spirit is only the third horse in the 147-year history of the race to be disqualified after finishing first. The decision erases Hall of Fame trainer Bob Baffert's record seventh derby win. Baffert will be suspended from all racing for 90 days. That span includes the first two legs of the Triple Crown. He will also not be allowed to race the Kentucky Derby for two years and not 
not get to collect the $1.8 million first place check. The three-year-old horse collapsed and died following a workout on December 6th. The cause of death may have been a heart attack. The big winner here tonight, the trainer of second place horse, Mandaloon, who will add the nearly $2 million to his record $31 million in winnings last year. And if you're wondering, anyone who placed some of the nearly $3 million wagered on Medina Spirit through the Derby's official betting partner will not have to return their money. Baffert's attorney says that his client will appeal the decision by Kentucky racing officials. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The murder-suicide investigation involving the sister of Bernie Madoff and our journey to the Galapagos Islands. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's how we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Now, with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. The Biden administration is urging Ukraine President Zelensky to head to Lviv for his own safety. This after Russian President Vladimir Putin announced he has recognized the independence of separatist regions in Ukraine and ordering the military to enter those areas. This move seen as an escalation in a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine, with NATO allies condemning the moves and the U.S. putting in place targeted sanctions. The White House saying it will announce additional measures. 
Today, the U.S. National Security Team meeting at the White House. Images showing General Mark Milley, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, and VP Kamala Harris all arriving for the high-level conversations. We never give up hope on diplomacy until the missiles fly or the tanks roll. The federal hate crimes trial of three white men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery is now in the hands of the jury. Closing arguments wrapped late today. The defendants chased Arbery through a predominantly white neighborhood nearly two years ago, then shot the unarmed 25-year-old black man after cornering him. The men have already been convicted of state murder charges. Prosecutors presented a slew of racist texts the men had used about black people. The defendants claimed the shooting wasn't racially motivated. A growing number of questions in the shooting death of 21-year-old college student Elizabeth Howell. On Friday evening, police found Howell's body on a road 100 feet from the campus of SUNY Potsdam in upstate New York, where she was a cellist in the symphony. A day later, police arrested and charged 31-year-old Michael Snow of nearby Messina with second-degree murder. The school says he has no affiliation with the college, either as a student, employee, or graduate. Howell's father tells the New York Post she didn't have enemies and certainly no one that would want to kill her. As soon as they told us, we figured wrong place, wrong time. Now police asking the public for information on the alleged killer's whereabouts on the day of the murder, releasing a photo of his gray Honda Civic. Well, things got out of hand at the end of a college basketball game after the coaches of the opposing team sparked a brawl on the court. Michigan head coach Juwan Howard says it all started when Wisconsin head coach Greg Gard called a timeout late in the blowout. The two exchanged words and had to be separated, but that didn't stop Howard from throwing a punch at a Wisconsin assistant coach, and then things only got uglier from there. I didn't like the timeout being called, and I'll be totally honest with you. The Wisconsin coach says he was just trying to explain why he took the last timeout. He came up to me and pulled his max max down and said I'll remember that and he started pointing it at me and tapped me in the chest for someone to touch me and I think that was very uncalled for for him to touch me in response coach Howard has been suspended for the remainder of the regular season and fined forty thousand dollars saying his actions did not represent the level of sportsmanship that is expected from the Big Ten Conference Medical examiners in South Florida are working to confirm that Bernie Madoff's sister and brother-in-law died in a murder-suicide. 87-year-old Sandra Wiener and her husband were found shot to death. The couple was among the victims of Bernie Madoff's massive Ponzi scheme in which he stole at least $20 billion. He died in prison last year. At least four people connected to Madoff have died by suicide, including his son, Mark. Britney Spears has been dropping hints of a tell-all, and now it may actually be happening. People Magazine reports the Princess of Pop has signed a $15 million book deal with Simon & Schuster. This comes three months after the termination of her 13-year conservatorship, which left decisions about her finances and health to her father and court-appointed conservators. In court, Spears said she wanted to sue her entire family and recently feuding with her sister, who also released a memoir. Last week, Spears revealed she'd received a letter from lawmakers in December asking to meet. She declined, saying she she was still healing. Now to the latest developments in Ukraine. Addressing his nation past 2 a.m. local time in Kyiv, President Volodymyr Zelensky saying, we are not afraid of anyone. This comes hours after we learned Russian President Vladimir Putin has given the order for Russian troops to move into two separatist regions of Ukraine to, quote, maintain peace. Those are the two regions Putin announced he will recognize as independent earlier today. Well, the housing market has been red hot throughout the pandemic, challenging those who have been in the hunt for a new home as they compete for a limited supply. And for prospective home buyers, a new challenge may be on the horizon, rising interest rates that will make the cost of borrowing for mortgage go up. ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze explains. For first-time buyers like Lauren and John in Washington, D.C., the housing market has been unforgiving. It was very daunting. Houses were flying. The couple put in offers on four different homes, all falling short. It was really discouraging, especially as it happened more times, you start to get a little panicked. Throughout the pandemic, aspiring homeowners nationwide have been fighting bidding wars and surging prices, fueled by strong demand and a lack of available homes. The new inventory that I'm seeing coming on is 
yeah, been increased by about 50,000. The homes have increased at least 30, 30 to 50,000. Now, first time buyers must soon overcome a new hurdle, rising interest rates. How do rising interest rates affect the overall economy. The modern American economy runs on borrowing. So when the cost of borrowing goes up, fewer people borrow, that slows the economy, and that's the way it's supposed to work. Economists say next month, the Federal Reserve is set to increase those borrowing costs by raising interest rates as part of an attempt to cool surging inflation. Basically, we have inflation because there's too much demand in the economy for the available supply. So the whole point of the Fed is to slow the increase in demand. They want fewer people to borrow, and they want people to borrow to borrow less. In anticipation of the Fed's mid-March announcement, interest rates on a 30-year mortgage have spiked above 4% for the first time in nearly three years. That means someone borrowing $300,000 to buy a home today is paying $143 more every month than in November, when rates were closer to 3%. Yes, it, it, it definitely makes it more unaffordable. Realtor Roger Taylor says first-time home buyers already overwhelmed by sky-high prices are trying to lock in a purchase now before interest rates go up even more. We saw that a large number of people started giving us calls in January because of these rate increases. They were going to wait out for the spring. So spring came early in Absolutely. the housing market this year. Yes, the weather didn't change, but the spring definitely and the market came early. Real estate brokerage Redfin reports 55% of homes that went under contract in the past month had an accepted offer within two two weeks on the market, the highest on record for this time of year. How fast are these homes selling once they go on the market? So if it goes on the market today, by this afternoon, they probably have a really good or multiple very good offers. Hours. Yes, hours, hours. The intense competition is only making it more difficult for a generation of first time buyers like Kristen Harris to get a foothold in the housing market. It's hard to find enough inventory to be able to even find something that you might be interested enough to look at in the first place. She's trying to buy a home in Virginia for her family of four. By the time we even like a house to put in an offer, it's already gotten an offer that's been accepted. And that's been incredibly heartbreaking. Supply chain backlogs on building materials have hampered the construction of new houses, making existing home sales even more competitive. Are there enough homes for those first time buyers compared to the demand that we're seeing from them? Absolutely not. Um, and that, that's the, big, the biggest driving force right now is because inventory is so low. You have buyers that were naturally going to come into the market this year competing with buyers who were unsuccessful in purchasing last year. This lack of supply combined with the risk of higher monthly payments is prompting some aspiring homeowners like C.J. Reeves to reconsider where he wants to live. Every month I have to pay rent, I, I, I think about a mortgage. <laughs> he moved from Virginia to Georgia to try to buy a home when COVID hit and work went remote, but soon realized he was outpriced. Looking to build equity, he's now searching for houses in North Carolina. Last week, I was supposed to go see one home, and I thought that was going to be the home, honestly. And literally, it was gone by the time I sent it to my, I, I sent the address to my realtor. <laughs> CJ says he's unwilling to make compromises like waiving inspections or appraisals, or buying a home that needs to be fixed up, especially as building materials get more expensive. It was a calculation Lauren and John considered when they put in their fifth home offer. This one, finally a success. What advice would you have to other first time buyers who are struggling to successfully put in an offer? I would say really think in advance about the costs and how much you are comfortable with paying and really think about the additional costs that you don't hear about when you just see the price tag of the home. Buying a home is daunting, but when you have it, you get it and you know that it's yours, I think it's one of the greatest feelings that I've had. Daunting but rewarding are thanks to Elizabeth to the UK now where Queen Elizabeth is recovering from her mild COVID symptoms. ABC's Lama Hassan has the latest. Tonight, the Queen isolating behind castle walls after Buckingham Palace revealed she's experiencing mild cold-like symptoms after testing positive for COVID-19. The palace is simply saying, look, she's OK, she's, she's, she's got mild symptoms. She's been, I know they've not confirmed it, but she's been vaccinated three times. So there's no real cause for alarm. It comes amid growing concerns for the health of Her Majesty after Prince Charles and his wife Camilla both recently tested positive for the virus. 
The queen, who turns 96 in April, was last seen on Wednesday using a cane, quipping she wasn't able to move. How are you? Well, as you can see, I can't move. For much of the pandemic, the Queen has been shielding in Windsor Castle, but in recent weeks taking on more engagements and celebrating the start of her Platinum Jubilee, 70 years on the throne. I think I might just put a knife in I it. think that's a really good idea. Tonight, the palace confirming the Queen is continuing with her duties as head of state, Her Majesty keeping calm and carrying on. I think we probably won't see or hear anything um, now until she's out of it and she's able to continue her duties without any restrictions. Keeping calm and carrying on our thanks to Lama. The Galapagos Islands are where the theory of evolution was born and today like so many pristine locations around the globe some of its stunning sights and beautiful animals are being threatened. Our Amy Robach traveled to this remote archipelago to explain how climate change is bearing down on this island's delicate balance. <laughs> The Galapagos Islands is one of the most unique places on Earth. With pristine wildlife largely untouched by human civilization. But underneath the waves, it feels like a different planet. Snorkeling off the island of Española, I was greeted by baby sea lions. <laughs> oh my God, this is so cool. One of the species most vulnerable to a warming ocean as curious and innocent as puppies looking right at us, some seeming to perform for us. The archipelago straddles the equator, but surprisingly, life here is dependent on cold water. Currents bring nutrient-rich cold water from Antarctica, rising to the surface as it collides with islands, supporting the entire food chain. But as water warms, that cold water doesn't make it to the surface. And without those nutrients, fish and algae die off, and animals that feed on them face starvation. In the afternoon, we hike more than a mile across rocky terrain to a blowhole. <sighs> Where marine iguanas cover the beach. These colorful reptiles can only be found in the Galapagos, seen swimming through the water and onto the rocks. The species now becoming a barometer of climate change. They're perfect environmental indicators. They can tell you how healthy an environment is by looking at their numbers. There are specialized reptiles. They specialize in only feeding on green algae. They cannot digest brown algae or other species of algae. But there's a problem with the water becoming warmer and having more extreme temperatures among some of the temperature waters here, the green algae disappears. El Nino seasons, which used to happen about every 10 years, can supercharge warming, catastrophically reducing the food supply temporarily. These remarkable creatures ward off starvation by shrinking, their skeletons getting up to 20 to 30% smaller to survive with less until the El Nino subsides and cooler water returns. Now global warming is making El Nino years more frequent and more intense. Our thanks to Amy for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. So much in this newscast tonight was about division, but here's an image of people coming together. Residents in Sydney, Australia, finally able to embrace loved ones in other countries after fully vaccinated non-citizens were allowed to visit for the first time since March of 2020. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, we continue to track the latest in Ukraine, particularly the military and diplomatic options that remain on the table. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my 
My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is what being live is Three all tracking. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The FDA is looking at the possibility of authorizing a fourth COVID vaccine dose in the fall. A recent study showed that the third shot, known as the booster, offered 91% protection against hospitalization, but that falls to about 79% after four to five months. The FDA's vaccine chief told the New York Times that the fourth shot could be paired with a flu shot, but there isn't enough data to recommend another dose just yet. Sources tell ABC News that President Biden is expected to announce his Supreme Court nominee by the end of this week. We know the president is considering at least three candidates for the job, all black women. The president's team has spent the last few weeks reaching out to senators on both sides of the aisle, hoping to get support of some Republicans. California just set a record high for gas prices. Right now, gas there costs $4.74. That's $1.21 more than the national average, according to the AAA. Experts blame higher oil prices and inflation for the increased prices. But we do begin with that dramatic escalation in Ukraine. Tonight, ABC News has learned Russian President Vladimir Putin has given the order for Russian troops to move into two separatist regions of Ukraine to, quote, maintain peace. This comes as the U.S. is urging Ukraine's president to evacuate Kyiv for his own safety. Speaking to his nation late tonight, Zelensky said, we are not afraid of anyone. The United Nations meeting tonight on all of this. Senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports in tonight, again from Ukraine. Tonight, a dangerous escalation in the Ukraine crisis. Russian President Vladimir Putin formally recognizing two pro-Russian rebel areas in the east of the country as independent, ordering his military to move across the border under the guise of peacekeeping. In an hour-long, sometimes angry speech, Putin questioning Ukraine's legitimacy, accusing its leaders of being a puppet of the Western world that's trying to undermine and weaken Russia. And after days of false flag operations that Western leaders say are manufactured, Putin telling the Russian people it's actually Ukraine attacking, with this warning to Ukraine's leader. Uh, we demand you immediately cease military action, says Putin, otherwise all bloodshed will be on your hands. Putin is using justifications like peacekeeping, which no one outside of Russia will believe, but the Russian people will believe, because Mr. Putin controls what they see and hear. The move could open the way to Russia formally annexing the regions, which it's de facto controlled in any case. President Biden, for a second day in a row, convening an urgent meeting of his national security team. Despite warning of catastrophic consequences, the White House choosing to impose relatively minor sanctions for now. The European Union also condemning Russia's move as a blatant violation of international law and promising more sanctions. Earlier in the day, in a bizarre orchestrated performance, Putin gathered his top national security advisers on live TV to ask if he should recognize the rebel regions as independent. Unsurprisingly, they all said yes. Russia's amassed more than 150,000 troops around Ukraine's borders. New satellite images showing some of the Kremlin's forces less than six miles from the Ukrainian border.
The fear is whether tonight's announcement might just be the opening move in a larger scale, devastating invasion of Ukraine. The White House calling Ukrainian President Zelensky tonight and urging him to leave the capital immediately for his own safety. If Zelensky leaves, that would certainly say a lot. Ian Panel joins us now from Ukraine. Ian, you've been telling us for weeks that many on the ground there in Kyiv never thought this day would come. Yet, as reported, Ukraine's president is now being urged to leave the capital city. At this point, is anyone optimistic that there could be an off-ramp of some kind, that diplomacy could prevent war? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, Zelensky hasn't entirely been in denial, but he's certainly been trying to minimize this. And yet now tonight he's being told that he should leave Kiev for his own safety. I think he's unlikely to heed that warning for a number of reasons, but primarily because of the signal it would send to the Ukrainian people. I mean, above all, he's been trying to avoid creating a sense of panic. I think if the president of the country beats a retreat to Lviv in the West, uh, then that certainly would set panic amongst the population. Um, I, I think he's in a very difficult position tonight. Yes, he has lots of allies around the world, but I think he's looking more isolated and potentially beleaguered than he has throughout all of this crisis. You know, he can have all the ammunition, all the arms, but he now faces one of the strongest armies in the world. And we've heard from Vladimir Putin that he intends to at least support the independence of this breakaway region in the east of the country, but nobody believes he's going to stop there. And if he goes any further, then how does Zelensky, how does the Ukrainian military respond? And the feeling is that if all Vladimir Putin wanted to do was declare independence in the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic areas in the far east of the country, well, you don't need 150,000 troops to do that. Lindsay? That's right. All right, Ian Panel, our thanks to you as always. Now let's bring in James Longman in Moscow, where the U.S. Embassy is warning Americans to avoid large crowds. James, you watched that speech from Vladimir Putin today. He appears to be questioning not only the legitimacy of Ukraine's independence, but also the independence of several countries once governed by the Kremlin. How is this all being received in Russia? Yeah, it was extraordinary, Lindsay. I mean, more than an hour of a history lesson, a revisionist history lesson, I'd say, from Vladimir Putin, who kind of seemed sort of completely unchained, unscripted, going through all his grievances. Uh, one of the major themes, of course, was basically that he sees himself as a leader, reaching back through history to re-establish a Russian empire. And he does not see Ukraine as an independent nation. He called it an inherent part of our culture, our history, and spiritual space. Um, the other big theme was his anger about NATO that he sees as this kind of expansionist uh, uh, alliance which is threatening his borders. Uh, he listed all the years that NATO has expanded since 1997 and basically said that the West has broken its promise. And he also cast Ukraine, of course, as the great aggressor. Some of the claims were extraordinary uh, that even Ukraine was actually preparing uh, a nuclear weapon, a weapon of mass destruction to launch at uh, Russia with Western help and that it was a puppet state uh, run by the United States and Europe. Look, these are all messages that uh, Russians have heard time and time again. So they might seem crazy to the rest of us, but this is very much on message for Vladimir Putin here in Russia. And James, also talk to us about that dramatic meeting that Vladimir Putin held earlier today with his Security Council. Oh, I mean, Lindsay, this was absolutely extraordinary, and no one here has ever seen anything like it. There's never actually been uh, a Security Council meeting televised. For a time, everyone thought it was live until someone spotted uh, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov's watch, which showed that it was a different time, so it wasn't actually live. You basically had Vladimir Putin in this kind of Cold War scenario uh, with his sort of politique in front of him, all the sort of senior members of his cabinet, the foreign minister, the defense minister, the heads of the intelligence agencies, and one by one, he was calling on them to get up and, and tell them just how much uh, each individual really wanted the Donbass to be recognized. There was one extraordinary moment when actually the head of the chief of the foreign intelligence uh, uh, agency was getting so flustered that he messed up his lines and you had Vladimir Putin who seemed to quite enjoy this moment telling him to hurry up and then this um, individual managed to say that he was looking forward to these states being rolled into the Russian Federation which was an overstep and Vladimir Putin laughed and said oh no no not just yet um, but I think there was something darker about this this was about Vladimir Putin getting collective responsibility for his war live on television or as live on television making sure that everyone knows that they're all in it what does that tell us it shows that that he's making sure that if this goes wrong, whatever he has planned, they've all taken responsibility for it. So it tells us that he's got something more planned, perhaps. It's not just going to end with a Donbass, and that's scary. Lindsay? Really interesting how this is all playing out. James Longman for us in Moscow again tonight. Thanks so much, James.
Putin's declaration of support for those separatist regions is causing some difficult diplomacy in Europe. ABC's Inez de la Quatara has the latest from Paris. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, and it was actually French President Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz who were first informed of Putin's decision to recognize those separatist regions in eastern Ukraine. Tensions in Europe are at an all-time high right now. The EU is calling for sanctions to be imposed, but it's unclear how far those sanctions will go. Europe is in a tricky position here because Europe relies heavily on Russia for its natural gas supply. As much as 40% of gas in Europe comes from Russia. And so there's a real concern that if the EU were to impose tough sanctions on Russia, Russia could retaliate by cutting off the EU's gas supply. And that, in turn, could lead to higher gas prices. And already, some countries in Europe, like France, for instance, are dealing with record high gas prices. So there's bound to be some debate in the coming days as to how far those sanctions should go. The other thing is that it was really EU leaders who were leading the way on diplomacy here. So you had French President Macron, who spent his day on the phone yesterday. He spoke with Putin twice. He spoke with Zelensky. He spoke with Biden. And the Kremlin did say that both Schultz and Macron expressed a readiness to stay in contact with Putin even after he informed them of his decision. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens. And on Friday, the French foreign minister is set to meet here in Paris with his Russian counterpart. That meeting was arranged prior to all of this taking place. So it'll be interesting to see if that meeting still happens. Lindsay? It will be, Inez. Thank you. We're joined now by ABC News Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz, who's been reporting from the region. And Martha, Vladimir Putin has given the Russian Defense Ministry the green light to assist in what they've called peacekeeping. And these separatist regions are claiming more territory than they actually have. So does this mean that there's a chance the Russians could go in and push these boundaries even further? A absolutely, Lindsay. They could push much further if they wanted to do that. I mean, I think you just look at 150,000 troops uh, around surrounding Ukraine and, and probably more than that because they keep adding those troops. Uh, and it's very likely, and certainly the White House officials in the White House and officials in the Pentagon believe they will push in further, believe they will go to the capital. And uh, one official told me he believes they want to take the entire country. This, of course, would create all sorts of casualties. It would create a refugee crisis. We drove down to the border today. We're in Lviv, Ukraine right now, drove down to the border about an hour and a half from here. Uh, it was a two-lane highway. You can imagine if hundreds of thousands, if not millions of refugees tried to leave this country, what a horrific problem that would be in a humanitarian crisis indeed. Martha Raddatz on the ground there for us. We appreciate it so much. To help us understand Putin's decision from a military perspective, we now bring in ABC News contributor and retired General Robert Abrams. Uh, General Abrams was an advisor to former U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel during the last invasion of Ukraine and more recently was the head of U.S. forces in Korea. General Abrams, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, there are nearly 200,000 Russian troops at this point on the Ukrainian border. Walk us through how this decision by Putin changes the landscape in the east. Well, I think the, the thing that, Lindsay, that everybody needs to understand here is the, the two decisions by Putin. One, to recognize uh, the two independent states of Luhansk and Donetsk. And then secondly, to send in peacekeeper. He's basically given the green light for the vast majority of his combat forces to basically move into Ukraine, move into Ukrainian sovereign territory unopposed uh, facilitated by these Russian separatists that, that have been fighting there for the last eight years and then posture themselves for further offensive operations, as Martha just mentioned. And there's a great deal of disinformation coming from the Kremlin to the Russian people at this point. How does this lay the groundwork for Putin to move into Ukraine? Well, I think one, one of your previous reporters uh, stated this is right out of the Russian playbook. And, and he will start with... This is about protecting Russian people. They have long claimed that these are, these are Russians that they're protecting in eastern Ukraine. And only Mother Russia has the wherewithal to protect Russian citizens wherever they are. So as, as everyone knows, in the last three to four years, they've issued some 750,000 Russian passports to Ukrainian citizens who live in eastern Ukraine, all to give them the protection and the excuse for being able to now claim their independence and now put Russian troops on the ground in a separate state. This is right out of the Russian playbook. 
They followed the exact same playbook in 2008 in Ossetia, in Georgia, and they did it again in Crimea in 2014. And how can the U.S. and NATO allies, though, fight this rollout of disinformation? Well, I think, I think NATO and the United States have, have done a remarkable job thus far. And first and foremost, we have to be first with the truth, first with the facts. We have to be aggressive in the information space. We need to continue to be proactive in the information space. We need to continue to share intelligence as it becomes available to reveal all of the, all that's playing out over the last 24 to 48 hours. The, the United States and NATO revealed all this some 72 to 96 hours ago. And we should continue to do that to continue to strengthen international legitimacy for all actions being taken by not just the United States and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but the European Union and everyone. So we have to continue to be offensive in the information space. And of course, we've talked about what an invasion in the East could mean for us here in the United States. How concerned, though, do you think that Americans should be about a Russian cyber attack? I, I don't think we're anywhere close to a potential Russian cyber attack uh, here in the United States. Um, but if you think our gas prices are high now, I heard earlier uh, record highs for gas in California. Uh, a a full-out invasion in eastern Ukraine will only drive those gas prices even higher. It, what additional military actions by Russia would it take for NATO to really ramp up their military response? Well, I, I, I'm not, um, I think that's, that's a bit premature. And right now, we should be focused on using the other elements of national power, specifically with diplomacy, information, as already mentioned, and really the economic elements of national power. We saw some limited sanctions being imposed today, and that's where NATO's main effort needs to be in the coming days. Uh, but we're, we're far from where we might want to consider additional NATO military defense options. Sure, and General, if you were a betting man, what do you think that the chances are that Russia will in fact launch an invasion of Ukraine within the next few days? I, I, I think, well, well I'll, I'll take it from a different approach. I, I'm of the opinion that uh, this region has been at war for the last eight years, since 2014, albeit with Russian separatists, but these are proxy forces for the Russians, supplied by the Russians, uh, advised by the Russians, and in some case, non-attributed Russian forces have been operating there. So the moment we see the first elements of, quote, peacekeepers enter into eastern Ukraine, I say the invasion is on. And with Putin giving the order just a couple of hours ago, I expect here in the next 12 hours we'll start to see it. Oh, well. All right, General Abrams, we thank you so much for your time. Still to come tonight, the wall being built between Haiti and the Dominican Republic and diving for history. Stay with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. <laughs> Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? 
We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky he put his family himself in jeopardy for us. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb this. shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The Dominican government has begun building a wall that will cover almost half of its border with Haiti. The border, which is more than 240 miles long, is an attempt to stop irregular migration along with the smuggling of goods, weapons, and drugs. Haitians who share the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic cross the border in search of work in the fields or in the construction industry. About 500,000 Haitians and tens of thousands of their descendants live in the neighboring Spanish-speaking nation. In Belgium, the the ride to happiness has been stalled. The terrifying incident caused nine adults to be stuck for more than seven hours on a roller coaster over the weekend. Despite hanging out over 100 feet in the air, all the people were safely removed, and most only suffered minor hypothermia. While you still may be trying to figure out the obsession with the game Wordle, a Nigerian linguist is creating a board game in the hopes of helping to preserve the Yoruba language. The board game named Yuba Lingo was developed in 2019 with just cardboard papers and colored pencils. Yoruba is spoken in parts of Western Africa and experts fear that it may not survive the next 50 years given that Nigeria is one of the most linguistically diverse countries in the world. The board game is going through the last bits of graphic redesigning and will be released in the market early next year. She is the first black National Geographic explorer to ever grace the cover of the iconic magazine, and she is on a mission to find and document shipwrecks. Tara Roberts is hoping to find the wreckage from sunken slave ships, humanizing the story of the slave trade and bringing these important stories to light. Roberts' journey and discoveries are chronicled in a new podcast, Into the Depths. Tara, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hi, it's great to be here. So explain how all of this happened. You had a successful career as a magazine editor, then quit your job a few years ago when you learned about a group of divers who were uncovering the wreckage of slave ships. Describe that discovery and, and how it changed you. So it all started with a picture. <laughs> it was a picture in the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And it was a picture of a group of primarily black women in wetsuits on a boat. And I had never seen a group of black women in wetsuits on a boat before. So it completely captured my imagination. And I ended up reading more about them. And I discovered that they were a part of this group called Diving with a Purpose, and that their mission was to help search for and document slave shipwrecks around the world. And I was blown away. I knew I had to be a part of this some way. And I'm curious what you've witnessed with your own eyes and your emotional response to, to what you saw. Mm. It maybe seems like it should be a really sad story. And I say there are definitely sad notes. Um, finding something like a shackle, mm. like that hits you. That That's not an easy find, especially when you know what what happened there and what happened to the people. There were emotions that came up that I didn't anticipate. And these were emotions of pride, of empowerment, um, of agency. 
There's a lot of history that has been lost on the ocean floor. They estimate that there are as many as a thousand wrecks down there. But to date, less than 10 have been found and properly documented. And there is something really powerful about being an ordinary person who just likes to scuba dive mm -hmm. and saying that I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to be a part of finding this history, honoring this history, and raising it from the bottom of the ocean floor and back into humanity's memory. So. And you use the word empowering, and, and, and I'm curious when, when you talk about it kind of conjuring up that kind of reaction. On your Nat Geo magazine cover, it says, searching for shipwrecks from slavery's hidden past to help heal the present. What is it about the experience that's healing or empowering? There were, I don't know if you know this number, because this was surprising to me, but 1.8 million Africans are estimated to have died in the Middle Passage. But who's mourning these people? Who's grieving them? Um, where are the memorials to them? So part of this work in going down is honoring these ancestors and saying that their lives mattered. And so there is healing, I think, in that. That 1.8 million is a, is a stunning number for sure. Uh, in the podcast, you said that, that what I was experiencing was a sense of longing. I think this is a unique thing for African-Americans. Where is home for us? What did you mean by that? So most African-Americans face what genealogists call the 1870 brick wall. And that just means that before 1870, the U.S. Census did not count identifying details of those who were enslaved. So most of us are not able to trace back. Um, we're not able to know what our ancestors experienced. We don't have those stories. We have a lot of the stories of pain and trauma, but we don't have stories of their lives. I wasn't able to trace back to a slave ship, but I was able to, I hired a genealogist and I was able to find out more details about my great-great-grandfather who was born enslaved. And he's somebody whose history I was afraid of. I was afraid it was going to be way too painful um, for me to face it. And so I didn't really want to touch it. But because of this process, because of going back, because of encountering this evidence from the past, it gave me the courage to look back at my own family. And what I found was amazing. My great-great-grandfather, who was born enslaved, turned out to be an entrepreneur. He was a real estate investor. He was, he fought in the United States colored troops in the Civil War, like all these details that my family didn't know we were able to find out. And so now I find, I feel all this pride for my ancestors. And that wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't have started to do this work. Well, just fascinating conversation. Tara, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. You can listen to Into the Depths podcast now. And the March issue of National Geographic's magazine is online and on newsstands now. And still to come, the touching reunion as a dog meets the people who help save its life. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? 
Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Wild video out of Miami after a helicopter crashed into the ocean. It all happened on South Beach Saturday afternoon. As you can see, the beach was packed at the time. Thankfully, only two people were injured and reported to be in stable condition. Finally tonight, you could call it a dream day for Dreamer the dog who got to meet the heroes who helped save her life. Reporter Matt Henson from W Day News in North Dakota has tonight's local lowdown. Oh my goodness, hot dogs. She loves that. Dreamer. I never would have thought. Tammy Moore was the dispatcher who took the call from a man who at first thought Dreamer was a piece of cardboard in the road near Hillsboro. Right here on that blanket. Moore and two deputies filled empty soda bottles with hot water and covered the dying dog with blankets from the jail until they could get Dreamer to an animal hospital. You are so healthy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a good girl. Oh, hey, sweetie. The love continued at the Red River Animal Emergency Hospital in Fargo. It was amazing. She honestly looks like a completely different dog. That's where a team of vets saved Dreamer's life. According to police, the dog had been dumped by its overwhelmed owner and then left to die in wind chills that dropped to 45 below. Dreamer looked like she was about seconds away from death, to put it lightly. When she first came in, it was too low to read. The thermometer wouldn't even give us a temperature, it just read low. Journey Home Animal Rescue in Grand Forks placed Dreamer in a foster home for recovery. Six weeks later, Dreamer is almost fully recovered, except for some frostbite on her tail. <laughs> Described as a food hound. She's gained 20 pounds and can eat on her own, something doctors thought may not be possible due to how long she was in the cold. It just reminds me this is why I do this. Just for her to be the dog that she is now, um, considering what she went through, is amazing in itself. Yeah. Happy ending there for Dreamer. Thanks to Matt Henson for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is what being live is Three all back. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. Ah.